We're joined today by State Representative Joe Dorsey. Um, you recently announced legislation to create Student Freedom Account Program. Can you explain what this would accomplish? Yeah, so thanks for having me. The Student Freedom Account Act, House Bill 1904, um, would put uh, uh, state tax dollars that, that parents pay to begin with in, in, in their pockets and it would follow uh, their child to their school of choice. So in essence it would be a universal educational choice program. Uh, these exist across the country. Arizona uh, was probably the progenitor when it comes to ESAs or education savings accounts. Uh, Florida has one. Uh, West Virginia ha has has been a forerunner as well. So and you know we, we've flirted in Pennsylvania before with, with school choice. You know of course the EIT and OSTC scholarships, um, th those are all great. You know, I always like to say all of the above when it comes to school choice. I love it. And then, of course, with the Lifeline scholarships uh, that we almost passed this year. Um, but th this is, uh, I, to differentiate, House Bill 1904 is a universal for all children uh, school choice program. So how would the per student dollar amount be determined? Yeah, so there, there would be a calculation. Um, so within my bill, the, the calculation is uh, the, the, the income for the district on an aggregate in the state, uh, the school district divided by the ADM or the average daily membership, and this is in an aggregate sense. Um, and that breaks down to about seven or eight thousand dollars per student in Pennsylvania. Um, we we spend uh, about twenty one thousand three hundred dollars per student in Pennsylvania, which is, I believe, in the top five in the country. In fact, I was just talking with. Uh, uh, a school choice advocate in Texas yesterday, and they spend eleven thousand. So we're, you know, about ten thousand more than than the Lone Star State in per pupil spending. Um, but uh, yeah, it would be. There's three buckets. Look at it. Look at the school funding in Pennsylvania as three buckets. There's the local bucket. There's the federal bucket, which is the least amount, and then there's the state, and the, the state portion, which is the only portion that. Mm -hmm. I can control and other legislators uh, comes out to about a third and and mathematically that's that's about a third of that twenty one thousand uh, dollar pot so about seven thousand per student so as you mentioned the the three different components of where the funding comes from um, would you like to see that funding mechanism change in any way perhaps more state versus local control and funding well I mean I, I don't ha have an opinion on that I, I understand it, it is the way it is and you know as we speak the the basic education funding uh, you know work group is, is working on that um, so I, I think I think the mechanism in which we fund uh, education is probably a separate topic uh, I, I do know just to repeat that we spend an awful lot of money per student uh, in, in Pennsylvania and I think uh, a robust system that allows parents to choose with flexibility and options for parents is probably the best way forward. Now, you've already um, referenced the EITC, the Educational Opportunity Tax Credit. Can you explain what that is and how that works and how your legislation would work either compared to that or alongside of that? Yeah, so the EITC and OSTC tax credits, I don't have an exact uh, date on when that that came into be in the legislature. I think it was about a decade ago, long before I was a representative. I'm I'm a mere freshman, um, but that that allows uh, businesses uh, to to donate to to a private parochial uh, you know school uh, and and just deduct that as as a as a tax write off. So um, there there was uh, a cap on that, and and you know from what I heard as a as a legislator is um, there would be long wait lists and and actually you know they they would come and go so quickly they were so popular in the state and and you know that's a great thing and it's even better that you know we signed into law uh that you know here in December before the holiday, the $150 million increase. Mm -hmm. and, and that's wonderful. Um, now those tax credits on average, I believe, are about $2,500 per student, which, which is nice. Uh, in fact, uh, at my press conference when I unveiled House Bill 1904, I had a gentleman named Miles Slade Bowers speak, uh, who, uh, as a testament to the ITC scholarship, that helped him uh, get out of the situation that he was in, and he enrolled then in Bishop McDevitt, uh, and it was a true success story. Um, the way the way that compares to my bill is, you know, look at the numbers. There's that 2,500, would, which might complement a parent. It helps, mm -hmm. uh, but that's a, a far cry from that seven or eight thousand. Um, and you know, I 
private school, just to, to take a hypothetical, uh, costs probably year, a year's enrollment costs more than $2,500. So, um, you know, I, I think it's a more robust thing. It's, it's not, I, I sometimes say we're nibbling around the edges in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. We have, we had the pass, which was the $100 million um, a budget appropriation, and that would have helped the bottom 15% of uh, students from those schools, which is great. Um, and then we have these EITC, OSTCs, which average about 2,500. But this is, I would describe this as the whole kit and caboodle. It's a universal school choice program uh, with that full state uh, dollar amount. What prompted you to offer this legislation? Well, I, I've heard from constituents. I, I've, I've read the polls. I, the, the striking thing about educational choice is um, it is very popular. Uh, and you would hope that would, if it's popular with, with the public, you would hope that would translate into something that's popular in the legislature, which, which hasn't, it hasn't really happened. But um, depending on the questions asked in the poll, we're looking in, in Pennsylvania at anywhere from two-thirds to eight out of ten uh, Pennsylvanians are, are for it. So, so there's that piece. You know, I, I, I think as a representative representing 65,000 people in the 47th, uh, it's popular. So. Um, I, I want to do the will of my constituents. My constituents are for it. Uh, the other thing is I, I, I've heard it said um, that's, that school choice or the lack thereof is a human rights uh, issue, or yeah, a human rights issue. Um, and in fact, Miles, Miles Slade Bowers, who I referenced earlier, believes that as well. Um, particularly in, in some of these bottom performing schools, there, there are reading and math proficiencies that in some cases are 0%. And to not afford those students uh, an escape hatch uh, is, is troubling. And, and that is a human rights issue. Um, so so there's, there's the moral aspect of it, too. And, and just as a, as a kind of a, a third answer here, I, I am a limited government guy. Uh, I, I believe in freedom. I believe in options and choice. And, and I think from the 30,000-foot view, um, why wouldn't we uh, give parents you know, that option with their own tax dollars? If your bill were to pass, how would this legislation affect the stability of existing public schools and their funding? Yes, yeah, so it, it, it's a common myth uh, that you know these programs take take away from public schools. Um, so we referenced before the the seven or eight thousand dollars in state funding that would follow the student to their their parents' school of choice. Well, the remainder there uh, actually stays in the sending district. So. It's not a matter of depriving public school of their dollars, and, and I would argue that it's not their dollars to begin with. Their the taxpayers provide those dollars. So there's there's the economic impact, which I just answered, but um, then there's the outcomes. So we have the luxury in Pennsylvania um, of, of watching other states that have been forerunners at these universal educational choice uh, provisions. Arizona, I mentioned, Florida is another one that the, these programs have been in place for a long time, enough, enough to collect data and kind of learn from their mistakes, which is a luxury we have. Um, and what we're finding, there, there was a study recently done in Florida uh, by a gentleman named Figlio. Um, and what he found in his study was as their choice program in Florida matured or as time went on, um, not only were the, the kids that were, you know, exercising their opportunity to go to a non-public school having success. Um, but the outcomes in the public schools were rising. So, and that's great. And I, I, I often have to say, you know, the disclaimer, I'm not anti-public school, and I'm really not. I, I, if you like your public school, you can keep it, as Corey DeAngelis says. Um, my mom was a public school teacher for 35 years. I'm a product of the public school. Love public school. We have a, we have a constitutional obligation to provide, you know, that support, those resources to public schools. But school choice, my point is, it, it, uh, it improves the outcome of a, at public school. So um, yeah, I, I think a, a rising tide lifts all boats, and that's what we've seen as we peer across the country at some of the other states that have gotten it done. Regarding the private and parochial schools who theoretically would benefit under your legislation, are those under the same academic standards and oversight as public schools? How does that compare? Well, the, so under my bill, they, you know, the, 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 there's standards from PDE, 
um, that that come down like like the uh, the standardized tests and and everything like that. So um, they would be under the same ire as as public schools are. Um, and then you know under under House Bill 1904 too, there 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 is there are still um, there is robust oversight. Like for instance. Um, you know, in other states like Arizona, in the past, there's been a little bit of fraud with their ESA system. Well, we've worked into my bill um, a, a way for the Auditor General, if there's probable cause, to, to look at maybe someone who's defrauding the system. <clears throat> so we like oversight in that way. Um, but I, I, think, I think at the end of the day, um, and, and competition shouldn't be a bad word when we talk about education, because in the marketplace, it always produces a better product at a lower price. Certainly, we're not, I, I don't want to superimpose the marketplace on our children. I, I care deeply about our children. It's not mechanized in that way. But like we, like we see in this Florida example, um, if a, a rising tide lifts all boats, and if choice allows both those students to, to get out of schools where they're not learning well, and those students that are remaining in the public schools, their outcomes are improving, why wouldn't we support that? Are there specific interventions you'd like to see put into place to help those poor performing schools? Well, um, so with with the life Lifeline scholarships, the past scholarships, that, that was an appropriation specifically addressed to that bottom 15%. <clears throat> I think when you look across the country, uh, these, these bottom performing schools, just by way of statistic, um, uh, are usually centered in those urban areas. And there's probably various reasons why that is. Um, but uh, the, the point is, the solution is, is choice, because when uh, in Arizona and Florida, I'll just reference those again, Ohio, Utah, Iowa, some of these states that have, that have gotten this done, they've seen that, that in, in those urban centers, uh, when there is robust choice for parents, uh, the outcomes rise. But back to your point, I mean, we, we discussed this when we were building this bill about maybe uh, phasing phasing in, like maybe the, the uh, final destination is universal, but we first start with that, that mm -hmm. bottom 15%. <clears throat> the way we, we wrote it currently doesn't allow for that. However, you know, I just introduced this bill. It's subject to amendments. Mm -hmm. uh, I've discussed with colleagues from the other side of the aisle about, about that phase in, and, and I, I, believe, I believe it was Iowa that did just that. They, they started with the, the bottom performing children and then moved their way up you know, the spectrum to true universal. I'm certainly open to that. Um, that that's not the way it's currently written. Um, but, you know, passing, <laughs> passing a law is a long process. There's an amendment process both in the House and the Senate. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm certainly open to that. And, and we'll, we'll work on that if that's the consensus. Well, as you're talking about your proposal currently being a universal program and you know, being open to considering phasing it in. By comparison, for the EITC, there's a finite amount of money dedicated to that each year. How is that determined who gets access to those funds? The EITC and OSTC. I'm, I'm actually not sure. <laughs> I would have to look into that. Well, we were talking about um, the poor performing schools. What would you like to see put into place to incentivize them to want to improve their performance? Geez, good question. Um, I mean, I, I'll just hearken back to this. Um, we know from, from the data, and, and we know from some of these states that, that have gotten this done, that choice is actually the mechanism to do that. Competition will, will bring a little, a little bit of incentive for, for schools that are doing poorly to, to quote unquote, get their act together. Um, but the point of the matter is, um, is parents know how their kids learn. So if they have that choice, <coughs> excuse me, and they have that, uh, that money to, to follow their student that would give them the, the freedom to send their, their child to the school of their choice, they, they will just naturally send their kid to the, to the institution or the, or the hybrid school or the pod or whatever it might be um, that, that, that addresses that need, that addresses that mode of learning. Um, so, I mean, I, th I think the incentive is choice. I, I think the, the, the solution is choice. Um, and, and like I said, I'm for all of the above. I, I was a supporter of Lifeline and Pass. Um, I, I was clapping when we got the EITC scholarship mm -hmm. expansion. I think, um, 
I think generally speaking, we're, we're looking at education uh, the way we looked at education in, in the 40s. Um, <clears throat> these are newer generations. There's new technology. There's, there's new specialization. Um, and, and I think uh, it, it, we, we, we might get left behind if, if we don't make significant changes. And uh, like I said before, uh, giving parents the option I just don't understand why why that must be political. I, I, I just think it makes sense, and uh, and and I'm I'm fighting to get that done in PA. Do you see this issue falling on political lines in the legislature, or do you think it's more nuanced than that? I've talked with uh, some of my Democratic colleagues, and <clears throat> in concept, um, we have a lot of common ground. Um, now. I'm, I'm new to the legislature. I'm, I'm one year in. I would still consider myself green. Um, I haven't been through this this battle. I, I, I wasn't there when we voted on on EITC before, other than this this provision that was part of the Ed Code bill this time around. I would like to think that it's not partisan. Uh, my fear is <laughs> my fear is that I don't know any better, and it actually is. I, I know that there's that there's stakeholders involved that wield a lot of power in Harrisburg. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll say this, um, th these areas, these urban areas where, uh, you know, where, these, where, where we're finding a lot of these bottom 15% performance schools, <clears throat> a lot of those areas are represented by Democrats. I know that on my side of the aisle, you know, we have almost overwhelming support for, we certainly did for the tax, the tax credits um, and uh, lifelines. Universal, we, I'm not sure where we are. Um, we're still working on that to see where everybody on my, in my caucus is. I would hope that the people that represent the very people that would benefit the most from, from something like House Bill 1904 would be able to get on board. Uh, because I, I personally don't view it as, as a political matter. You know, we're, we're talking about educational choice. We're talking about the future. Um, you know, we have we 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 spend uh, a prolific amount of money on public public education in Pennsylvania. Like I said before, twenty one thousand three hundred per student. Uh, the governor was touting his historic uh, investment in public education this past budget cycle. That's fine, um, but uh, <laughs> it, we got to see that translate to results. And when you look at the national NAEP scores, th those those are are not very good. Uh, the standardized tests in, in, in Pennsylvania aren't very good. Uh, not many kids, you know, not a majority of kids are reading on grade level at the, at the third grade level. So funding public schools, fine. Um, but we also want to see a, a return on investment as, as legislators who, who it's incumbent upon me to protect my taxpayers. And it's, it's also incumbent upon me to, to give the students of my district and in Pennsylvania the best opportunity possible. You had noted that your mom was a longtime legislator, leg, educator, excuse educator. me. She was a longtime educator. How did that influence your views on Pennsylvania's particularly public school system? Well, I, you know, I had a sounding board whenever, whenever I uh, needed one. Um, and, you know, we, we actually, my mom and I talked the other week about cursive writing. And I was like, because uh, Joe Adams actually has a bill that he's introducing to, to bring back cursive writing. You know, uh, it, it helps with brain development. There, there's all sorts of reasons that cursive writing works, but I wouldn't know that unless I checked in with her because she had an answer. But um, it's always good. Um, it's always good to, good to get a variety of perspectives, and it, it's been helpful to to use my mom as a resource on this process because, unfortunately. <clears throat> this side or the school choice uh, movement is sometimes labeled as anti-teacher. Um, and I'm certainly not against teachers. That's a, that's a moniker that I reject. Um, but to bring my mom into the fold and, and to ask her and, and, and other teachers that I know that are, that are in my circle, um, it, it's always great to get that perspective because they, they're the boots on the ground. They're the ones teaching, teaching our students and, and preparing our next generation. Last year, the Commonwealth Court determined that Pennsylvania underfunds its public school system. If more money is able to be put toward public school, will that solve the problem, or are there other factors at play? I, I don't think more money is necessarily the, the solution to the problem. Um, we've always historically funded our public schools. This, this past budget cycle, as I mentioned before, with Shapiro's proclamation, uh, made astronomical in, in improvements or, or additions to the, the public education budget. Um, meanwhile, 
you know, you have uh, uh, this trend that that started well before COVID of uh, public and school public school enrollment dropping. Um, so if if more money were the solution, um, we would have uh, we would have kids that are much more prepared for college. We would have test scores that were through the roof. Um, you know, we, we would we would have have kids just ready, able to read at, at grade level more than you know, the percentage that it is, which is low. Um, but back to the Commonwealth Court's decision, um, <clears throat> something that we shouldn't miss in, in that court opinion uh, from the judge was uh, they gave latitude to the legislature. Yes, we have a constitutional amendment to fund public schools. That's, that's what it says in the Constitution. It's enshrined. We have that obligation as a legislature, legislature to see, see that through, so long as it is, is in our Constitution. Um, but that, that court opinion uh, gave the legislator, legislature latitude uh, to come up with a solution. I would argue that the solution is, is choice. Um, and, and they're not mutually exclusive, funding public schools and, and offering parents choice. Uh, we can offer parents choice through, through House Bill 1904, but like we've discussed already, continue to fund uh, public schools and give resources to public schools. It, it's not it's not one or the other. It's most definitely both. The Basic Education Funding Commission has been holding a series of hearings over the fall, and they just met um, in January again to, to reveal their data. What do you hope to come out of that, and, and how do you foresee uh, perhaps the education funding formula changing in the future? Well, I, we're, we're all watching that, all, all, of, all of us on the House Education Committee and everyone in Pennsylvania who, who cares about education. Uh, their findings will come out shortly. What I hope, it, what I hope it's not is, is uh, a Republican version and a Democrat version. You know, I, I would want some common sense, uh, common themes uh, that myself as a legislator you know, my friends from across the aisle can, can come together and, and, you know, come up with something constructive. So I, I hope that there, I hope it's that and not like a, a partisan situation. Um, but uh, I, I would, I would uh, estimate uh, that more money is, is probably on the, <laughs> on the docket. Um, and we've discussed in, in plenty of detail today that I'm not convinced that's, that's the, the solution to the problem. Um, but uh, we'll see what it yields. Can you explain briefly what the hold harmless provision is and how your legislation could perhaps sit alongside the home har hold harmless provision? So I don't think um, I don't think my legislation would would affect hold harmless, but hold harmless is basically the concept that a district, no matter if they're bleeding students or gaining students, uh, cannot go backwards in in education funding. Now that doesn't seem to be a just system because you you know my former remark about school districts bleeding students well if if you have far less students and you're getting more and more money each year that doesn't seem very equitable so um, on the contrary you have districts across the commonwealth uh, particularly it's set uh, South Central Pennsylvania seems to be one of the areas that's growing. You know, on a net, we're losing people as Pennsylvania. Last year, I believe it was 40,000. This year, it was 10,000. Um, but uh, um, that, that's what hold harmless is. And, and I, I, think that's, I think that's one of the injustices that I would hope uh, the Basic Education Funding uh, Commission would address. Where's your bill in the legislative process? My bill has been referred to the Education Committee, of which I'm a member, um, and uh, I'll have to have a conversation with Chairman Topper, to, or not Topper, Chairman Schweier, uh, to get you an answer on where it is in the process. Um, <clears throat> like I said, I hope it's not, a, it's not viewed as a partisan thing. I will continue to diligently lobby for it, um, and uh, we'll, see, we'll see what happens. Former State Representative Andrew Lewis offered similar legislation in 2021. What makes you hopeful that your bill might be a little bit more successful this time around? Well, and Andrew's a good friend of mine, and he, he was integral in, in the drafting uh, of my bill. I, I think there's never been a time with better momentum as it relates to educational choice. I mentioned Florida and Arizona. Since 
since those two uh, forerunners, we've we've had other states. Tennessee is currently very close to, to passing educational choice. Texas, there's a very fiery debate in the Texas House, and they came very close to a universal plan uh, in November, and it seemed to be like an 11th hour thing that shot it down. North Carolina just this past year passed educational choice. Ohio, another neighbor to our west, uh, um, recently expanded their choice programs. So I think, yes, it polls well. Yes, it's popular. Yes, the results are good. Um, but I think, I think the eyes of the nation are kind of seeing these programs unfold in, in some of, in, in, you know, North Carolina, Ohio, they're bellwether political states. Why can't it happen in Pennsylvania? So I, I think that's the distinction. Uh, uh, between uh, a measure like Andrew's from a couple sessions ago and my measure now. I think time, in short, mm -hmm. time is on our side. A few weeks from now, Governor Josh Shapiro will be making his budget address in February. Uh, last time around, the budget was at an impasse, in part due to disagreement over the past scholarship program, which has been somewhat compared to vouchers. Do you anticipate that issue will come up again in this budget? I... I would hope it would. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I took the governor on his word last time. Uh, you know, it's not just something that he that he vowed uh, in that last year's address, um, but he campaigned on it. And um, you know, I, I I think we were we were quite close to getting it considered in the House. And I think I think if it's if it's considered in the House, if it's considered an education committee and in the House, if it's actually brought up, it passes. I think the only obstacle was was Democrat leadership holding that up. So uh, I hope that it does. Um, I'm not privy to a lot of those conversations as a as a green legislator myself, uh, but we'll see. I'm hopeful. Lawmakers are not scheduled to come into regular voting session until mid-March. What will you do between now and then to help forward this initiative? Well, um, I'm, I'm making a lot of phone calls uh, to see where some of my colleagues are. Uh, I'm writing a lot. I've been very active with, with writing uh, op-eds, uh, gathering stakeholders that, that, that are willing to, to phone representatives and write representatives. Um, and uh, we'll just uh, try to keep this, this fight in front of, in front of people and, and uh, explain what school choice is. You know, of course, uh, to us, it's, it's something that we've heard plenty of times, but uh, to people who aren't, aren't as, as engaged, I, I think it takes some explanation sometimes, some education as to what exactly we're talking about. Um, and uh, on each of those points, I'll, I'll continue to, to move forward. Representative Joe Dorsey, thank you for joining us today. Thank you.